Hey, it's great to see you. Go ahead and grab your Bible. If you do that and you turn to the book of Luke, okay, we're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 17. Everybody grabbing a Bible. Hope you brought your Bible with you. Maybe you brought your journal as we've read the text this past Friday. Uh, I'm going to ask the question. You've kind of seen the theme running through this whole service together in our prayers, our songs, uh, the scriptures. How many of you, mass confession, how many of you need healing today? How many need healing today? Praise the Lord. We have some who are honest among us. All right. Um, some of y'all need healing from your, from, from your timidness, right? But think about it. There's a lot of different ways uh, that healing can come. Some of us need physical healing. We really do. Maybe you've given up. Maybe you say, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it's the way it's going to be. And I'm going to get this kind of downward spiral till the day I die. Well, we all grow older. We, we get older. And ultimately, there will be something, some illness, something that will take us all down, right? Two of the finest men I've ever known in my life have passed away over the past two weeks. And one of them is uh, Larry Bird. We're going to celebrate his life as we have been. But we're going to gather together on Friday. If you want to come join us right here. And we're going to celebrate his life because he is completely healed. And he is worshiping the Lord. And that's where we're all heading. We're praying for Pike Peterson in our day. Some of you know Pike is a teenager in our student ministry. And he's been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and and he's received a transfusion. He's, he's received a donor match with his brother. And he's starting to show signs of rejection. And so our preaching team, we just called during our prep time together in a meeting and called Paul and said, hey, tell us more. He says, it's been hard two weeks. So we're praying for Pike. Our deacons gathered on Monday night and we prayed for healing. We prayed for people, for you. We prayed for many of you in our church. We do it every time we gather. Tomorrow morning, our staff will gather and we're going to pray for you because prayer guides every meeting that we have. And we're praying for healing because healing comes in all kinds of forms because our dis-ease, our dis discouragement, our discomfort comes in a lot of forms. We talk a lot about mental health. We have a lot of a lot of mental illness, right, that we all wrestle with. Maybe for you, it's anxiety, it's worry. You're praying for healing, or you're just trying to make it one day after another. Maybe it's emotional healing of some form. Maybe it's a relational healing. You're estranged from someone. You're praying, you're calling out for God to move in someone's life. So can I ask the question again? <laughs> How many need healing today? Praise be to God. It comes in big ways, comes in small ways. Um, I was out working in the yard yesterday, Stacy and I, and that's part of the result of the fall, by the way, when you have to do that. Some of you like it. I'm not one of those people. That's a waste of a lifetime, if you ask me. Um, I'm going to move in that tower right across the street. That's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to walk across the street. Um, praise be to God. Is that, is that uh, what is it, mountain cedar? That's what, it, that's what I'm wrestling with today, right? But uh, healing comes from, yeah, that's first world problems, right? But healing can come in big and small ways. And today we're going to continue our series talking about encountering Jesus because we're looking at people who encountered him along the way. We said in Luke 9, chapter 51 is where the whole book turns, the life of Jesus turns. There's a pivot, we'd call it, where everything changed. It says that when he knew it was time to be taken up, he turned his face toward Jerusalem. It's another way of saying he knew it was time for him to go to the cross. He's heading now to the cross. Check this out. That's Luke chapter 9. You know how many chapters are in Luke? 24. Because Luke spends 30% of his time in the final week of Jesus' life. John, the apostle, spends 43% of his uh, gospel in the final week, the Passion Week. Of Jesus, And we've said as a church family, we're going to do the same. We're going to slow down because this is important. And in the church calendar, we slow down to say, let's, let's focus in. Let's get out of regular patterns. Let's enter into a season of restraint where we don't maybe eat as much as we eat. Let's skip a meal. Let's pray instead. Let's stop this particular habit. Let's be accountable to each other. Let's focus in. 
And I hope you're doing that in the word daily as you walk along with us through our dwell reading plan. But we're in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19 will be the text. It's going to set us up for the Lord's Supper uh, as we share in communion, common union in Christ today before we leave and head out into the day and into the week ahead. You're going to see three things here. First of all, the healer sees your pain today. Some of us need to be reminded of that. That the healer's drawn to your pain. And we're going to see that the healer is better than the healing. You've heard this text read before. It's the 10 lepers is what it is. And uh, you likely know the story, right? You've probably had it te- taught or preached this way where, hey, all 10 were healed. Only one came back. Be like that guy. Amen. Let's go. There's more going on here than meets the eye. And that's what I want you to see today. Our focus will not be on the healing. Our focus will be on the healer. And so it says in verse 11, the word of God tells us on the way to Jerusalem. So he's on the way. We've talked about that. He was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. He's in the northern part of Israel. He's coming down from from Galilee in the north. You know, the Bible map there. He's coming down. He's right at the border there. And he's coming into Samaria. Now he's right at the border. So this is a place where most Israelites, most Jews, devoted rabbis in particular, would not, they'd go around, they'd go a different way. You didn't go through Samaria, you know this. Instead, Jesus intentionally is going through Samaria. He's going through and, and coming upon people, encountering Samarian, Samaritans, who are ethnically, racially, socially at odds with the Jewish people, or I should say the Jewish people are at odds with them. They would have nothing to do. And then these half-breeds, the, these non-committed uh, Samaritans, they were hated by the Jews. Jesus goes intentionally because that's what he does. He, he steps into this place. Verse 12, and as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Now, this is likely a diverse group of people. They're right there at the border. Some maybe Samaritan, some Galilean, some. They all were bound, though, by one thing, right? They were united in their pain. And if you've experienced that before, if you've ever been to an AA meeting, if you've ever been to an NA meeting, I've dropped in on some of those meetings because of friends who are receiving a coin or something like that, drawn together in their addiction. It's powerful. We're here, we're drawn together because of our love for Jesus today. But we're, we're, we're drawn together first because we're all, we're all sinners in need of his grace. And those of us who've received his grace, we come together to celebrate that he's rescued us. He has healed us from the greatest dis-ease, the greatest illness of all. And we praise him. But they're united by this one thing. We see uh, this 40 times in the Bible. It's interesting. We see leprosy showing up. It was common in ancient Israel. It's still common in places like Asia, Africa. It, it, you probably know it's a skin disease. We call it Hansen's disease today. And it's incurable if you don't treat it. And it can be contagious with close contact, but they believe probably like we didn't know what's, co- what's, what's up with COVID. We don't know what's happening. They would, they would say, you got to stay away. If you, have, if you have leprosy and it's not treated as it can be today, uh, you're... you're your extremities start to waste away, literally rot away. People with leprosy would lose their noses or ears. They would lose, their, their face would be deformed. They'd lose uh, fingers and toes until it kept eating, up, eating away. This, this was a horrible skin condition untreated. But because it was incurable, people saw it as a picture of the debilitating nature of sin or influence of sin on a person's life. This is a common kind of theology. Now, I don't know that we go there often, but when we think someone has done well, they must have done good. If you do good, you must do well. You're going to end up doing well. And if you haven't, if you're not doing good, you must have not done well. We, we still go there, but it was very much a belief. Even in John 9, you might remember the story of the blind man and the disciples themselves asked, hey, who sinned? Was it him? 
or his parents because somebody's to blame for this. Because what would happen was, see, to make it even worse, these people are ostracized. They're pushed aside. They could not come near someone. And if they were gathered in a group like this, gathered in their pain, gathered in their isolation, gathered in their grief and shame, they were removed from the gathering of the people of God. I mean, think about that. To make matters worse, it says in Leviticus 13 and in Leviticus 14, it says that they were not to have any social reaction or interaction with anyone in the community of faith. They could not gather with the people of God. They were ostracized. Imagine being told you are removed from your family, from your friends, from people you love. You are excluded even from the family of God. Now this begs a question. Pause for a moment. Who might who might we consider as lepers in our community today, in our society today? Who, who might that be? Think about it. What group might feel that from Christians, stay away. You're not welcome here. Could it be? Now, some of you might... My, there's, there's a lot of different ways we could look at that, I suppose. Some of us, we look at this polarized political environment we find ourselves in. Some would say, well, it's, it's got to be those strict, unloving conservatives. They don't belong here. And then others would say, no, it's the, the aimless, misguided liberals. That's who it is. Someone who votes like me, I'm out. I mean, I mean if don't, don't vote like me. I, I, I know. I can't. I can't. But you know, my mind went to, did yours? I thought about those in the LGBTQ community. Anybody else? And, and I just want to say, say this real quick, because so many people who wrestle with same-sex attraction or maybe not wrestle with same-sex attraction or you're struggling with sexuality, you need to hear this today. Two things. One, we are radically devoted here. In our church, we are radically devoted to holiness in our lives. We come to faith in Jesus and we turn everything over to him, which includes our sexuality. Radically devoted to becoming like Jesus and the word of God guides us to become like him. And when the word of God doesn't match up with our desires and what we want, what our preferences are, we align ourselves to the word of God. So a radical devotion of, to holiness includes a radical devotion to sexual purity and holiness. And we're radically committed to a biblical orthodox vision of biblical Christ-centered sexuality, which means we read the word, we're created in his image, male and female, he has created us. We are integrated, holistic people. We, we see that, that marriage is between a man and a woman. We, we see that, that, that it's, it's in this covenantal relationship Sexual intimacy takes place in marriage alone between a man and a woman, radically devoted. And I could go down all kinds of threads of where we're committed to holiness in our lives. We often want to throw rocks at people who maybe they sin differently than we do. But we have our own thing. We are committed to holiness. And only the power of God can do that work in us. But at the same time, watch this, we are radically committed to hospitality. Holiness and hospitality, two coexisting realities, holiness and inclusion, holiness and welcoming. We are welcoming because we are like Jesus who calls us to him. But he says, come to me, everyone is included and I will change your life. I will change your desires. It's this radical Inclusive exclusivity we talk about. Everyone's included, but there's only one way. There's only one way. And it's through Christ alone. And again, when our desires don't match up 
we align our lives up with him. And by the power of his spirit, he allows us to change and to live for him. It seems these lepers knew something about Jesus, doesn't it? Did you catch that? They didn't cry out, unclean, unclean. They cried out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. What had they heard about him? Well, we can imagine. Perhaps they heard he was a friend of sinners. The people who were ostracized, pushed out by the community of faith, were actually welcomed in by him. That's what got him in trouble. The Pharisees couldn't handle it. The Sadducees didn't want it. They said, this man is a friend of sinners. And, and we, we know too that in Luke 5, he healed a leper and he touched him. Nobody touches a leper. Jesus does. Jesus sees our, our, our illness. He sees our pain and he comes close to it. Who touches a leper? Love does. Jesus does. Who reaches out to people who don't look like us, don't act like us, don't vote like us, don't think like us? Jesus does. We do. That's who does that. They may have heard that it was the message sent to John the Baptist when he said, wait, are you the one? Because this is not going well for me in prison. And Jesus sent back the message. Do you remember the messengers? Hey, go back and tell John, everything's right on track. And here are the signs. Lame are walking, blind can see, and the lepers are being healed. They said, could it be? They're thinking, could it be that this is true? And so they yell out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And friends, you can do the same today. I, I run into so many Christians who who continue to feel the shame, either of our sins of the past, or maybe we feel, you're here today, you feel labeled. Maybe because of decisions you have made yourself or decisions others have made for you. And you feel, I don't always feel welcome. I feel like I, I don't belong. And if you're one of those, you need to hear this today. Jesus sees you. I'm thinking of so many people in this room. He sees your pain and he loves you. Look at what he does. Look at verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, catch that faith in action. As they went, they were cleansed. They were healed. They were made whole. Now, this is not unlike the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, all three saw the guy lying on the side of the road in need, but only the Samaritan. It says they all saw him. The Samaritan had compassion for him. Jesus has compassion for us. The healer sees your pain. I want you to see this. Nextly, the, the, the healer moves toward your pain. He comes toward your pain. Verse 14, again, I want you to see this. Go and show yourself to the priest. I don't know if you've ever seen this before or, or studied this. This is worth a moment, a deep dive, if you will. Just kind of geek out with me for a moment. Let's go to Leviticus 14. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to tell you what this sacrifice was all about. What did he do? What did all 10 of these lepers evidently do? Let's, let's say this, this one, you know, the one's going to come back. There's one that will come back. He went to the priest, and this is spelled out in the book of Leviticus. By law, this is what would happen. There was a, there's a detailed ritual. He would come to the priest, and the priest would have two birds. Two birds, and, one, and then he'd have a bowl of water. And the water would not be still water. It would be uh, water from a spring, flowing clean water just not unlike this kind of symbol of baptism if you will cleansing purity uh, they called it living water they would have he would have living water in the bowl he'd take the one the one bird and he would he would sacrifice then the bird the blood of that bird would fall into the water a mix of water and the blood then he would take a hyssop branch anybody tracking with me take a hyssop branch because that's what they used to to offer the sacrificial, the blood sacrifice on people for forgiveness. They would take the, the blood mixture and he put it on the other bird. 
He'd sling it on the bird. Then he would set the bird free. There's a guilt offering and there's a living sacrifice. He would sprinkle the blood, mixture of blood and water on the leper, having, having then diagnosed him as cured, okay, inspected, you are cured, sprinkle the blood on the leper and the leper then would be set free to fly. Two birds, one dies, the other is set free through the sacrifice, if you will, of the other, the blood sprinkled on that one, set free to, to fly. Can there be a, can there be a clearer picture of the gospel and what Christ has done for us? This leper, these lepers had no idea. He goes to see, wow. I mean, could it be, I've wondered, did they live long enough to see Christ die on the cross? Christ goes to the cross. He's the one who offers his blood as a sacrifice for us. And even here, the blood didn't make, ironically, surprisingly, the blood didn't make the leper then unclean, but clean. Not until you're sprinkled, if you will, covered in the blood of Jesus, we talk about it. Made righteous because of his grace covering you, are you set free? And this living water now that wells up inside of us by his spirit, we then can go and serve him with our lives. Now, here's what's happening, I believe. As we saw in John, uh, Luke 5, where he touches the leper, here he tells them, go, you're, you're healed as you go. I think what's happening here, he's showing us that healing is not a formula. This is important for us to understand. I, I can't force your, uh, my experience on you. Like, I came to faith this way. Or, here's how God speaks to me. Now, he speaks through his word. There's, there's, there are boundaries here. But... We all have different ways to encounter God. And, and, and the Lord speaks to us. I think the moment we want to make it a formula, then we say, well, I do this and God did that. I do this and he does this. I'm gonna do this and he'll do this until he doesn't, right? What is that about? Even today, some of you are thinking with me, you're thinking, okay, we're focusing on the healer, but not the healing. I, I need healing, but I, I, I'm not getting healing. And we're, as we said earlier, we're to pray for healing. How, how do we reconcile all of this? See, too often, as we'll see, we focus on the healing, not the healer. That's our problem. To look at this, I want you to see in, in Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Not only does he see your pain, he runs to you in it. He's not, he doesn't turn away from your sin. And, and that's where I want to go. Not just whatever your healing might, might be today, but your illness, how about this, your sickness, your sin does not repel him. Instead, it triggers him toward you with compassion. Sin, our sin triggers his love towards us because that's who he is. David figured this out. In his lament and repentance in Psalm 51, he says this, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a humble heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You will not turn me away. He's counting on it because he knows something about God. Do you know that he's not turned? Every time we fall, every time we sin, the healer comes to us and he longs for us to come to him because watch this, the healer is better than the healing. Verse 15, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice and fell on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks to him. And then the punchline, right? Now he was a Samaritan. He was ostracized by his leprosy. He was turned away from the family of God because he was a Samaritan. And he falls down. Says with a loud voice. Can you imagine this? He just shouts. He falls down. I bet you there were some others around who were going, wow, ease up. Man, this is awkward. Like, wow, this is too much. Like, you, you're a little bit undignified. This is Jesus. What would he say? Are you kidding me? Have you ever felt ostracized? 
Have you ever felt isolated? Have you ever felt like something you did or maybe didn't do has caused you to be set apart or people to label you somehow? Have you ever been overcome by a particular sin or maybe experience or a season in your life you feel like you can't shake it? Have you ever been removed from people you love? Have you ever thought your life was gonna go one way and then bam, you're hit with this and your dreams are crushed and now you're isolated and the only people you can relate to are the people who've gone through exactly what you've gone through. The leper was, are you kidding me? I will praise him as loud as I can. I will give him my life. I can become like David, more undignified than this. Are you kidding me? Have you ever experienced this kind of healing? And friends, if you have been saved by his grace, you have. Which is why we respond with everything we've got. Because we're all lepers. We're all unclean. With a disease that we cannot cure. And he's come to rescue us. And then it says in verse 17, Jesus answered, we're not 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Reminding everybody who he is. Why did the one come back? Haven't you always wondered why? Well, you just had a different attitude. Well, okay. Why is it that we're often the same way? Because we focus on the healing or not and not on the healer. He is focusing on the healer. That's the difference. Are you focusing on the healer? Well, Jeff, I hadn't received healing. Are you focused on the healer? Because he's the one. He's calling. He's saying, where are the others? Why is this one grateful and the others are not? The others are focused on the healing. And they've missed the healer. Is it possible? Think about this. In the human condition... You see, they all seek certification, if you will, validation, but this one seeks adoration. We can focus on the healing and miss the healer. We can focus on his goodness and miss God. You have been blessed today with help enough to get here. Have you praised him this morning for the fact that you're still able to get up? And be here today. I just spoke with Penny Lewis, who uh, was in our orchestra. Many of us, we've been praying, Penny, for you. Praying for her for weeks as we wondered what was going to happen. And last week and this week, she's back. The Lord has healed her. And, and she said to me just prior to the service, and now I'm just saying, Lord, what do you have for me now? She's come to fall at the feet of Jesus. She said, I'm not done. Friends, we have today, we have this week. You can have a home, you can have food, you can have a place to live, you can have friends around you, you can have a church family and not give praise to God. Are you a worshiper or are you a complainer? A worshiper says, I have been given so much. I will give him my life. Look at verse 19. And he said to him, rise and go your way, your faith. Don't miss that. He's reminding him, you didn't do this. Your faith has made you well. We see everything here. The reality of our need, the recognition of the healer, and the reason for our praise. It's all right here. Go. That word well is the word sozo. Don't miss this. It's often translated saved. It means to be holistically complete. Earlier in, in, in Luke 17, 5, it said, the, the disciples asked Jesus, increase our faith. What a great prayer. An exclamation point in the English. Increase our faith. And he said, yeah, if you have, a, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you're good. Like, wait, what? It's not about your faith. It's the object of your faith. You can trust in him, you see. This is the story of our predicament. Not leprosy, but sin. It's why Paul says in Romans 10, he says, there's a righteousness that's come through Moses. It's come through the law. Be good enough, try hard enough. But he said, then Jesus came. 
And as we set our hearts towards the Lord's Supper here together, verse 9, it says in, in chapter 10 of Romans, because if you confess your mouth, that Jesus, with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, Master, there's the word, ruler, leader, and believe in your heart, faith, that God raised him from the dead, you will be sozo, healed. You will be saved, made whole, complete in him, covered in his blood, covered in his rights. Friend, do you know the healer? Because as we come around the table, he became the disease for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says he, he became sin for us. He was the one who was ostracized. He was the one who was rejected, so you would never be. He was abandoned by his best friends. He was removed, rejected by even the religious community. He was the one who was left on the cross, accused, abused, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he took it all on so that in your darkest night and the darkest moments of your soul, you will never be alone. He is always with you because the healer sees you. The healer is drawn to you and the healer is better than the healing. And he has set us free today, and we have reason to praise him. And we're going to do so as he told us to do so. And so now, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's prepare our hearts for this holy moment of worship together. Lord, we thank you for the gift that you have given to us in Jesus. We cannot praise you enough. And so now, as we remember... We think of the blood sacrifice that you have made for us, the guilt offering that came upon you and how we have been set free to fly. And we give you praise even as we thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen.